Hey everyone, my name is Raif Darazi, and in this video, I am excited to interview our special guest, Fletcher Chu, to discuss his work at PRAA in Taiwan and the current efforts to end the HIV epidemic. But first, I'll introduce our esteemed guest. He is the Director of Communications at Persons with HIV AIDS Rights Advocacy Association of Taiwan, also known as PRAA. PRAA is a nonprofit organization that was set up by and for people living with HIV, along with advocates, friends, and families in 1997. Fletcher's work focuses on HIV policy monitoring, community-led research, and communications of the rights of people living with HIV. All right, Fletcher, thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad to have you on. Uh, thank you for having me, and I'm so happy to be here to share with my work uh, with the audience here too. Yeah, so I'll start out with like a really broad question that I ask um, people as they, when they come on. What is your general view of the current state of the global HIV AIDS epidemic? And you can answer that however you like. Okay. Um, I think uh, the current global HIV AIDS epidemic is still um, something that we need to address, especially with recently there's a launch of uh, UNAIDS Global AIDS Update 2023. And the document was entitled um, The Path That In AIDS. I think it, uh, it kind of like in, in the introductory of the documents, it um, emphasized a lot about the political wills on the matter of how to end HIV and AIDS epidemic. And that's very important things because um, I think we know all the tools and all the methods that we can end this epidemic, but it's just the lack of uh, the willingness to prioritize this work for the population to really end HIV and AIDS in, in different regions and different places. Okay, very good. And then bringing it home to where you currently reside, what is the current state of HIV specifically in Taiwan? Um, if we are talking about the current state of HIV in Taiwan, if we are using like um, UNAIDS 95, 95, 95 goal, in that um, situation, like uh, for Taiwan, currently 20, in 2022, uh, we have 90% of people living with HIV already know their status, and among them, 95% of them are already on antiretroviral treatment. And among those who are on antiretroviral treatment, 95% of them already reach undetectable viral load. So it's quite good at the moment uh, for those um, um, indicators, it's 90 95, 95, but it still get us that uh, a way that we need to move forward in terms of those uh, testing target or get people on treatment and maintain virus suppression. And you said for the moment, is the trend heading in a positive direction? Has it has it plateaued or what's how, what does that look like? Um, the new infection is actually has been de uh, decreasing um, for for a couple of years. And especially for this year, we believe that it's going to be lower than a thousand for the new infections. Yeah. And, and I think it's for the first time since 2017 that we got new infection lower than thousands. And I think that's the efforts of all the prevention tools and the treatments available for the population to get, get access to. And I know there are countries that are aiming to have zero transmission to end transmission completely is that something that's also in your goal in your near-term future um i i think i believe for for the governments and for um like a uh, public health um uh aspect um for zero uh, new infection would be an ultimate goal of that but i think from our side as the organization that advocating for rights of people living with age five we mostly more focusing on at the time that we haven't had a cure for everybody. We focus more on how to maintain the quality of life for those who are living with HIV already and will be living with HIV for the rest of their life be before the cure comes out. Yeah, and you mentioned um, you know, fighting for the rights of, of people living with HIV. On that note, what is stigma like in Taiwan? Um, I would say compared to the like very beginning of the epidemic, uh, the stigma is kind of like a hidden stigma uh, for, for the current states. Like uh, people wouldn't really say bad things about you in front of you, but if they're like on internet or 
Um, other things that we are observing is like uh, in healthcare uh, facilities or a nursing home, maybe they, they know about your status. They wouldn't decline you in front of you, but they will use all the excuses, say uh, maybe we don't have um, available services for you at the moment. Maybe you can try to check out somewhere else. Like, like they do it politely, but you know they are refusing you based on your status. And do people have good access to care as well? Um, for Taiwanese citizen, yes, uh, because we have national health insurance. Uh, it's a system that um, all of the Taiwanese citizens, they will be included in, in that national health insurance. And it's quite affordable. And, and there are a um, couple options of first-line treatment that people can choose on. But um, for expat or foreigner, it's, co- it's quite different because um, the mechanism for that treatment is different. So for the expat and foreigner, um, if they already have the national health insurance, but they haven't have like a register in Taiwan for the HIV status, they might still have to wait two years for the uh, first two year periods. And for those periods, they kind of like need to come up with their own means to try to find treatments or if if they found the the brand medicine is affordable for them in Taiwan, they can buy it in Taiwan, but mostly it's quite expensive for them. So what part of our work, we are also assisting people uh, who are foreigners or expats in Taiwan, and they try to get access to the treatment, whether from their home country or they will buy it from an online pharmacy and import it into Taiwan. And on that note, they will need to apply for Food and Drug Administration uh, drug importation approval. And it's quite, although it's free, but it's quite complicated for that process. So, and and it's only in Mandarin in that survey. So we will help them with the the language and all the process. And do you find that there's adequate uh, funding support from the government as well? from our perspective, because we are doing advocacy, and advocacy is always not a very um, like um, the, the the piece that the government would tend to fund. So, um, to to our knowledge, uh, most of the government or domestic funding for uh, AIDS will be uh, AIDS or HIV would mostly focusing on prevention and also like uh, some of the. Uh, care cascade in, in uh, healthcare facility for the health healthcare staff to um, maintain the relationship with the patient to um, get them on the treatment and maintain virus suppression. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious because here in the U.S., you know, we're, we're dealing with a phenomenon, especially recently, where um, certain political leaders are trying to actually roll back um, some protections and then especially preventative care like PrEP um, Mm -hmm. based on the right on on the belief that it infringes on religious beliefs and what have you. But essentially, at the end of the day, it targets marginalized groups. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you have any kind of similar issues where you are. Um, I think uh, uh, as you talk about PrEP, I think uh, um, PrEP is kind of also a little bit scaling up in Taiwan at the moment, but not very big scaling. But um, our government have some pilot project where they uh, provide partial of the funding to supplement people who need PrEP uh, if they meet certain criteria um, um, for that. But um, at the very beginning of the stage to launch those pilot projects, it also got some kind of uh, backlash from the anti-group. And it's also kind of based on the religious uh, problem that you just mentioned about. So. But um, I think the government um, stand on their point as some kind of the status they have seen, especially with I mentioned that um, the new infection rate are decreasing and uh, in coming uh, in in last couple of years. I think it's a combination of the prevention tool available and also the treatment available for people who in need of those uh, tools. Can you tell us because? I initially, I, th- I saw you because, um, I forget, I think it was on LinkedIn, but you were talking about the U equals yeah. U campaign. And then I saw on YouTube as well, you mentioning about that too. So can you tell us about your um, U-, U equals U efforts? Yeah, so um, it's actually, um, so so we had our U equals U day campaign this year on sec- 2nd of July in Taiwan. 
and it's a awareness、uh, campaign for the general population. And we are lucky that this、uh, was、um, supported by Gilead, where we can like kind of have a bigger scale、uh, of this campaign to really、uh, reach the bigger population. Because at the very first, that、uh, why we want to do this U equals U day campaign is that we want to、uh, take out this a、uh, message of U equals U very specifically to send out to、uh, general population instead of. I think a lot of time that when we are doing communication, are more focusing on our community.、Uh, I'm not saying it's not important, but、um, I think our 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 community have already have a lot of different resources and different organization working on delivering this kind of message、uh, to them to understand what's the science for nowadays. But for the general population, it's always very difficult for、um, uh, nonprofit organization to. Um, deliver a、uh, message to them. So we came up the second of July, a、uh, U equals U day in Taiwan, is try to raise the awareness among general population, and it's uh it's a very local context. Maybe you wonder why second of July, why it's not、uh, another day. It's because like back in twenty twenty one on second of July two years ago. Uh, we our government amended U equals U into one of the executive order of our regulations, where they define what is unsafe sexual sex. So、um, in the past,、um, they define the unsafe sex solely based on the content use or not. They didn't really、uh, care about your HIV status or not, and your uh, viral uh, uh, status or viral、uh, condition. But that has come to a place that、um, in 2018,、uh, the expert consensus statements、um, addressing HIV in in criminal、um, law context and those kind of information coming out. So we kind of like want to do an advocacy about removing that barrier in the regulation where people will think about、um, even you are undetectable legally, you are still defined as you are able to transmit the virus. So we want to、uh, do more things on on that context. So、uh, because the, the amendment happened on second of July to include you equals you into that、uh, criteria of unsafe sexual behavior,、uh, which means that after second of July, twenty twenty one in Taiwan, if you are undetectable and you have condom like sex with others, it's not considered as unsafe sex in terms of the in the context of HIV. So it's kind of a remarkable day for us in Taiwan. So we make it on second of July, and we also think that、uh, it would be、um, easier for our people to really try to find information online. And we are、um, very happy that、um, our government, CDC, also stand in solidarity with us. They come to the press conference on the second of July of the launch day of the U equals U day. And how did it go? How was it? Was it well received?、Um, I think for media coverage, because we we try to、uh, reach as much as media we can, and but we haven't done evaluation. We already done an evaluation on the media coverage, but in terms of、uh, people who really get the message, I think、uh, maybe there would be a post evaluation to see how many people really know about you equals you after this big campaign, but. Uh, it haven't been really uh, ended uh, for the campaign because for second of July it's one off. It's on that that day, but along with this second、uh, of July campaign, we also create a social experiment video on YouTube where we invite a celebrity in Taiwan who is a is a very straight man. He's a straight and middle aged man, and he's quite famous and very hilarious、uh, host in Taiwan. And his target audience is like those people we are never gonna reach. So that's the reason why we invited we we invited him. So he come and he's very good at doing、uh, entertaining shows and programs on TV. And、uh, what he famous for is、um, a scary box. I don't know if you have ever had those kind of like you have、uh, scary thing inside box and you put your hands in. Yeah,、uh, he's very famous for that. So we invited him to like we put U equals U inside the box, but we、uh, like make it with different materials, maybe like brushes or something. So you, when you put inside your hands into the box, you you couldn't see what inside. So you kind of like scare and 
that not know what to do when you touch it. But once you like reveal what is inside, it's actually nothing to you. And it's the same idea for HIV and AIDS. Like when you don't see, when you see the box HIV and AIDS and you don't see U equals U or PrEP or PAP inside, it will be scary. But once you know this kind of information that you will clear out the scary you might have around this issue. So that's the social experiment video that we do with the celebrity on on the, on, on the streets of Taiwan. And following down that um, videos that we um, still gonna have a, 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 a several posts with some of the key influencer in Taiwan on uh, 21 of July this year, because uh, we found out it's zero stigma day, uh, zero HIV stigma day on uh, 21 July this year, maybe every year, but it's also for us another day to try to raise more awareness around stigma and how to use you equals you equals you to destigmatize um, the the misconceptions around HIV. Well, what what an innovative and creative and entertaining way to, you know, get the attention of the masses of people like you said who normally wouldn't you wouldn't be able to reach or maybe wouldn't feel like it's relevant to them, yeah. and be able yeah. to get such an important message across. I think that's so genius, and I think we we in the U.S. can definitely take notes from that and and execute in that way that's re that's really brilliant so now that the government has acknowledged that viral load is important being undetectable is important and that that leads to safer sex um, not just condoms does that mean that criminalization uh, hiv laws have also been laxed or what does that look like yeah so currently um the the criminalization though is still there so we have an hiv special law in taiwan since 90 i could remember the exact 1919 i guess so um the criminalization though is still there but it's just like um for the component that if you are undetectable at the moment if someone take the charge on you or sue you or prosecute you and you have the evidence to um, prove that you're undetectable then it's uh, like a high possibility that you are not going to the trial or going to the court, but it is still, um, it, it's still possible to sue you or threaten you on that matter. So uh, kind of like in the long-term goal for us is to try to abolish or remove that law. And is that, is that, are you talking about disclosure specifically? Yeah, so the elements of the criminalization uh, around HIV, there are three components around that. Uh, first one is knowing yourself that are HIV positive. And second one is by not telling the person that you are ha having sex with about your HIV status. And the last one is um, having unsafe sex with them. So the, the part that we, we kind of uh, already address is about the uh, unsafe sex if you are uh, undetectable, then you are not having unsafe sex with them um, because we know about you equals you. But we are still kind of very aware about what if people who are not undetectable, it shouldn't really just based on their HIV status. And another big component of that law is also about uh, for people who are not, um, for the case where the new infection didn't really occur, um, it's still punishable. So it, it's quite a uh, go against uh, the principle that your needs are uh, holding, that your needs are actually very rooting for. If there, there's no infection, there's no new infections happen in this kind of context, then there shouldn't be any prosecution or sue among those cases. Well, okay. And speaking of the government and overall healthcare organizations, um, here in the U.S., especially, I think it was aggravated by the COVID pandemic, but there is intense distrust between community and healthcare, community and government, institutions, scientists. Uh, what's it like in Taiwan? Um, I would say that um, healthcare provider, especially physician, are usually and are and 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 they are still kind of like very well respect in, in Asian um, region, in Asia regions. And for Taiwan, I think during COVID pandemic, there's not that much 
mistrust happening in between the healthcare provider scientists uh, and with the society, because um, I think our government tried to control it pretty well. And I think one thing that COVID have contributed to HIV um, during this period of time is the health literacy for the people. Because um, like during COVID, a lot of people are talking about PCR as one of the tests, uh, how you test the viral load uh, within somebody. And in the past, there are a lot of people who are not, who don't care about uh, how to really understand what is PCR, what this viral load means to them. But during COVID pandemic, it's actually kind of become a norm for people to talk about, oh, do you know PCR? Do you know what viral load? And if you're infected with COVID, how's your viral load right now? So it's kind of give us an, an options. Um, also, in, in the U equals U day campaign I mentioned earlier this year, we can use this idea uh, in terms of the viral load we can use that to explain to the general population. Like back in the COVID, you know about if you have less virus in your body and it's not able to transmit, it's the same idea for HIV. So as HIV positive, you can take medication to lower the viral load in your body and it wouldn't be able to transmit just like COVID. Okay, brilliant. So there's some, you found some intersectionality there between COVID and HIV and you were able to piggyback on what people were already learning about the science mm -hmm. and the medicine, and then use that to explain HIV. That's yeah. great. Did the Speaking of COVID, did the pandemic have an impact? I mean, I guess we talked about it a little bit, but did it have a, a negative impact on HIV transmission rates or was it well-maintained? I think for, for um, during the COVID pandemic, there's not that much effects uh, in terms of the HIV epidemic in Taiwan because um, I think for different um, places or regions, maybe there's some, some of the disrupt of treatments in terms of people maybe being locked down or not able to go back to healthcare facility to uh, get access to treatment. But I think mostly uh, in, in Taiwan during that time, people are still able to access to treatment. So the infection rate didn't really go up. And and also because of um, social distancing, so people are not able to um, interact with other people sexually. So I guess that's one of the reasons why um, there's not a, a, a climb up um, in terms of the new infections rates during that time. And, and what would you say are the most um, at-risk groups, populations in Taiwan for HIV transmission? Um, for for the moment, um, it's still the uh, men who have sex with men population. Um, but generally, uh, if we're talking about um, the transmit uh, the trans transmitting uh, methods, is mostly about unsafe sex um, transmissions, and within that, um, MSN are still a big population of that. And okay, so what are your short term, long term goals to achieve through PRAA in Taiwan? I think short term is still uh, like for this year and next year, we try to like um, really get the message out uh, about U equals U because we, we found it could be a very uh, helpful and powerful tools for general population to really understand the science of HIV has progressed that much. And the reason why we want to pick it up um, like very individually is that we think this is very easy um, um, message for general population to understand. And the long-term goal, I would say, um, is still like very broadly the quality of life of people living with HIV and to remove the punitive law, especially the, the part that we just talked about, about the decriminalizations. And I think stigma is also a very big, uh, big component. It's kind of like related to uh, what you just mentioned about, you asked about how's the, the population affected by HIV right now at the moment in Taiwan is still mostly the MSN population. And it will kind of give the, the general society an idea that this is just an issue that relevant to a certain population and it kind of recreate the, the stigma. And although the, the, the statistic really shows that, but 
I think um, for us, we know it's because of the lack of information, lack of, um, lack of access to treatment or prevention tools, those kind of um, inequities that lead to that result that we are seeing now. But for them, they, they only see it as an issue that relevant to a certain group. I think that mostly, um, that certainly would be a part that we need to address, whether it's in short term or long term. I, I realized I meant to ask you this earlier, but how did you get involved with PRAA and HIV advocacy in general? Yeah, um, I I started out uh, with a, a research called Stigma Index. Uh, it's a, a research that uh, was initiated by GMP Plus Global Network of People Living with HIV and ICW and UNAIDS. So it's a it's a research tool to evaluate the uh, people living with HIV, how they feel about the stigma in the, the, the stigma they are experiencing in, in their country. So back in 2017, I was part of that research team doing the stigma index in Taiwan. And after that, um, because on that research, I we I was working in a hospital with a doctor on that project, and we collaborated with, with PRE at that time. And after uh, I done that project, I found I, I want to do more about um, the community size, so I come back and go to PRAA and stay here until now. Amazing. Well, there everyone is fortunate to have you on board. No, um, it's just like um, because during that um, stigma index, it's it's also although it's a questionnaire, but it's a semi construct questionnaire. So we get to interview a lot of people living with HIV in Taiwan. I think we interview eight hundred and forty three people living with HIV all over Taiwan and half of them were done by me and it's actually a, a experience that you get to hear a lot of different life stories and how they struggle or not struggle anymore and already living their life in, in their ways but uh, throughout that time you can really feel that um, there's a lot more to do to really make the community feel that they can live the life as people who are living without the virus. Is there something that you learned from those interviews that was surprising and or unexpected? I think it's the 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 interactions that give me a lot of impressions. Like I remember. One interview that I, I, I did is that uh, a middle-aged man, when I was doing interview with him and after the interview, because he shared a story about um, he's not the only one uh, who is HIV positive in his family. Uh, his brother also is also HIV positive because of the share needles in the back where they were not aware of their uh, sewer syringe program where they can get access to clean needles. So they share a needle and they uh, get infected. And his brother um, killed himself because of that uh, back in that time where he kind of like didn't have enough information knowing that he can survive and he can get access to treatment. But it is kind of like 20 years ago. So the situation was quite different. But when he um, kind of like... um, share all those stories that he experienced and after the interview i wanted to give him a hug then i asked him about that and the the questions um the response from him is that are you really willing to touch me like when i say to him that can i give you a hug then his reaction is like oh are you not afraid i think it's that that kind of internal stigma that still uh, with holds on some of the the populations that maybe um, I think, but it's most mostly for uh, people who may be elder or uh, lack of information. Because I, I'm also seeing that those um, young people living with HIV or people living with HIV uh, who are newly diagnosed but with more information um, knowledge, like U equals U, they are more confident with their um, status and. Um, maybe more confident um, about coming out on their HIV status. Wow. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, that story. Um, It reminds me too, when shortly after I was diagnosed, 
I remember my doctor made an effort to um, take off their glove and touch mm-hmm. my hand. And I just remember kind of get shocked a little bit because you don't realize um, when you learn certain things about, for example, people living with HIV, that you internalize this perception on yourself mm-hmm. um, and then almost see yourself as less than human and less valuable. Mm-hmm. And so for someone to, to make that gesture, it means a lot and communicates a lot more than just words. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And especially, um, I think when you talk about that, how we internalize the, the concept of people living with HIV might be um, not good in a certain way, like, for people who don't know message about you equals you or don't know message about um, HIV prevention tools, it, it, it will be very easily for that kind of things to happen. And what we're trying to do um, in terms of the communication to the general society is that whether you are living with HIV or not, it's, it's all the same. Right. And it should be treated like any other chronic manageable condition. Someone has mm-hmm. diabetes. Okay. You manage it, and and it's also your personal and private medical information as well, and should yeah. be treated that way. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. <laughs> well, you know, I've noticed over the years on YouTube, especially, a lot of my viewership is from the Asian region, and I like to think that it's because my content is just so amazingly good. But I think yeah. the reality is is probably that there isn't that many people like me speaking out openly on social media that um, a lot of people from different parts of the world have to turn to my content to 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 get that information so i my question is what do you how do you feel about about the visibility and the public media i mean you talked a little bit about um u equals u day and doing campaigns but overall do you think in media there is enough visibility and role models and things of that nature yeah, that, that's very good questions. And when, when you are talk, when we are talking about the social experiment uh, videos that we have in Taiwan, and you said that's something that we can you can learn from the states, but um, at the same time, in my mind, is that I like from from my perspective, I see a lot of different um, figures on the internet um, or like TVs or stars that on whether it's from the states or from Europe's or like typically Western countries um, are willing to stand out and share their, their life journey about being HIV positive. I think that's very big components for people to really see a person, not just a, a story behind the scenes um, or a picture behind it and to get the real like human, human context of uh, how people living with HIV would, would look like. And I think, um, um, to my knowledge, there are actually some of the public uh, people living with HIV in, in Asia Pacific region, but the, the problem may lies in the language and the cultural differences. So huge difference in different country in, in our region, whether it's in Southeast Asia or in East Asia, like we speak, like totally different language and i think uh like to my knowledge there are like um south korea and, and japan and taiwan and and thailand and indonesia i i kind of all know there are certain um people like with hiv who go public uh about their status but it's just that how the social media um is helping to get those message out to the general population or on the other side um is the general population being interested in getting this kind of information and if not what kind of strategy that we need to use to really generate their interest on this topic well i mean i think that your country has served in many ways as a very good model um, of how to handle the epidemic I mean, you've shown that by getting very close to 95, 95, 95, um, and you continue to have government support, um, funding, you have trust. I think that's another important element that we um, sometimes overlook is how important you can have all the best resources, you can have all the best doctors, you can have all the best programs, but if you don't have that trust there, then it doesn't, 
what does it matter? Because no one's going to listen to you and no one's going to take what you're giving, what you're offering. Um, mm -hmm. So that's important, having the visibility to the extent that you do. And yeah, I, I just think it serves, it can serve as a model and, and other Western countries sh should and can take note of that. But I, I think um, that when you talk about trust, um, it also reminds me about the partnerships. Um, I think in the last couple of years in Taiwan, uh, it's kind of like a close partnership uh, within the community and also the professional, especially the physician, where they are willing to help to promote the, the science of U equals U and the message of U equals U. And I think I also see that from the States as well, that um, especially I remember on 4th of July National Day on Twitter, HIV, CDC HIV, they, they tweet about a, a picture about U equals U. I think like for, for us, it's the context of 2nd July, but for you, um, National Day, 4th of July, uh, for a government institutions, they're, they're willing to get the message out on that day. I think that's also a very important component for, for the citizen to uh, see the political political willingness to acknowledge that kind of information. Absolutely. And especially having a um, more progressive government at the moment also helps. But again, at the end of the day, um, there is so there's so much more distrust here that mm -hmm. you can see those things. But I, I think I find often it's met with cynicism. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's hard to get past that. So that's that's our challenge here. For sure. I'm sure you'll, you'll kind of like push it through uh, with the applicants like you. Yeah, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do our best. And, and part of that is really understanding community and understanding what the community needs and what the community wants instead of just saying, OK, we're going to develop a drug and here you go. Take it. It's like, well, what are the needs of, of the person? Do, are they unhoused? Do they have um, drug use problems? Do they have um, mental health struggles do are they mm -hmm. financially okay because if they're worrying about all these other things then going to a clinic to get prep on a regular basis and maybe pay for it if they have to is going to be at the bottom of that list so mm -hmm. it's like this holistic way of approaching it with wrap we call, we'll call it wraparound care that i think is how you begin to foster trust again mm -hmm. all right well we are coming up on our time here so before we go is there anything else that you would like to talk about or share or say to our viewers that we haven't discussed already? I think we pretty much cover all of it, but um, but because I mentioned about U equals U Day in Taiwan, it's on 2nd of July. And, but the idea of that is not try to only talk about U equals U on that day. I think the, the concept that we are coming out for that day is kind of like the pride. Um, you, you will have a pride for, for a day or for a month, but it's not only for that day or for that month to, to talk about LGBTI rights, um, but it's it's a, a month or a special time for you to unapologetically loud to make the message out for the people around you. And, and it's also an opportunity for uh, people who want to uh, support this kind of message, but I think some people may be found awkward to share on day-to-day -day basis because they will find, um, find the people around and asking them, why do you share this kind of information? Is this relevant to you? Are you gay? Are you HIV positive? So I think um, a special day or a special period of time, it creates a, a savior song for the people who would like to stand in solidarity with us to get the message out uh, as possible as we can. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. I love all the work that you're doing and let's keep in touch. Um, if you have updates or want to fill me in on anything, I'd love to bring you back on or just share some information that you have. Everyone at home, please comment below your thoughts, your questions if you have any. I'm happy to follow up on those with Fletcher as well. And um, do let me know if you'd also be interested in having him back on the channel. Thanks so much, everyone. Please like this video, subscribe, hit that bell so you get a notification every time there's a new video. And please share this with anyone who you might feel might find this valuable. I will continue to do content that talks about HIV, not just here in the US or in the Western world, but all around the world because it's a global epidemic and we need to have these discussions.
all around the world. Cheers, everyone. Thank you.